tell, today we're going to tell you how to treat carpal tunnel with some good stretches to help you hopefully avoid surgery. Listen, carpal tunnel is a very common syndrome. It's often misdiagnosed. So before you start any of these stretches, you want to make sure that you're sure you actually have carpal tunnel and not, and not some other type of um, syndrome that's going to give you burning, tingling, or numbness in your hand area. Okay? So keep that in mind before you start these and really make sure your doctor or physical therapist has done a good evaluation before you do these stretches because these stretches can make things worse if you don't um, truly have the condition or you don't understand the precautions with it. So there's certain risk factors that we don't always talk about um, as much, but are very, very, very important in understanding carpal tunnel. Um, there is a nerve supply and a blood supply to the median nerve, and the median nerve is basically the nerve that gets compressed or pinched in the carpal tunnel. I'm just showing this hand here. These are the carpal bones right here. Okay, and then there's a little structure, the transverse a carpal ligament that runs over the top. It's kind of the roof of there. The median nerve comes through the center and gets pinched at some point in that area. But if you have an unhealthy nerve, basically a nerve someone that's got diabetes or um, some kind of cardiovascular problem, alcoholism, toxicity, some other condition can make the, this nerve more predisposed to getting pinched in that area. So addressing those concerns are really important to understand. It's kind of the holistic. We want to look at the whole approach. If we have sugar levels as a diabetic that are under control, it can make it very hard for this nerve to respond to stretching and, and, and some conservative treatment. And we want to make sure we look at this as an overall picture. We want to make sure we, we have the best situation as far as our, um, our, our overall body function and how that nerve can heal, the best environment for healing. Um, we will notice this, this is very interesting when you talk about backs, when people have surgery on their discs and such, they actually find that <clears throat> the people that are smoking, they take a longer and they don't do as well because the smoking affects the circulation of those small vessels. Nothing new with the surgery, nothing new with great exercise, it's something that affects the healing. So we want to be aware of that. Um, we don't want to have diets that promote like uh, high sodium diets that cause a lot of swelling in the area. That swelling can really affect the how the nerve functions. So there's something just to consider, and obviously we want to be healthier overall. So these things are good to work on, even if you're not talking about just a carpal tunnel. But it will affect how, um, how beneficial or how much you get out of these stretches. So another thing we want to address is the inflammation. There's an idea there's some inflammation around these nerves, okay? And the inflammation is basically a chemical reaction that the body's trying to heal, but sometimes that inflammation in itself can cause some delay. So oftentimes um, an over-the-counter um, inflammatory like an Advil Motrin, if your doctor allows, I can't suggest that, I'm just saying that that's what the doctor would tell you to do. Um, maybe an, a possible injection, a steroid injection into the actual tunnel, they'll actually go right into this region right here and you know loosen up the tissue and also drop down the inflammation and there's also natural therapies you know some things like turmeric or ginger or uh, a diet that's considered a um, an inflammatory diet like rich in those dark leafy greens all those things set up the environment for something that can heal better and hopefully respond to stretching and also some postural exercises and things that really set the environment so that area can heal and there's more room in the tunnel and they found too is interesting is um, they feel that this actual tunnel gets a little, sh little smaller as we age. It actually narrows a little bit. So a lot of the stretchers are trying to open up any kind of scar tissue in this area, anything that's not moving, any kind of lack of flexibility, and open up the area, kind of create a greater space for those nerves um, and vessels to function. So what else can we do to kind of make this situation a little better? One of the big triggers for carpal tunnel is a repetitive activity, something you do over and over with your hands. Um, it could be your computer workstation, your terminal. It could be a particular acti activity you really like. I have had a sculptor one time that was developing carpal tunnel. He just was doing hours and hours of uh, sculpting. He was really trying on his arms, his hands, and he started developing uh, carpal tunnel in both his, his wrists, and that, and that was a big thing. We had to modify how he was doing and and even giving him more rest days, you know, just off and on. He was going for very long periods of time on the weekend because you're trying to fit it in. And how can we separate that out so he had greater computer breaks? Also, a really good ergonomic setup as far as putting the wrist in neutral. And what does that mean? That's where some of the bracing comes in. If this is excessive extension, basically the wrist is back like this, okay, or like that, or excessively flexed, okay, so either extreme here. 
here excessively, like on a keyboard, or excessively extended, those two extreme positions actually narrow um, and, and the tunnel, actually, the carpal tunnel, and make, make it so there's less space in there. So we like to think of things being put in neutral positions. So if we're looking at a keyboard, we want everything lined up. So our wrist is essentially in a neutral position and also supported in some of these areas. So you're kind of, you know, supported and, and positioned. Also, we also want to kind of look at this whole body. We want to make sure ergonomically we're kind of partially lined up and set up so we're nice and upright. Um, so the, the arms are set up in the right position. And we don't have points... So, because the median nerve is down here, but it radiates, not radiates, but it actually connects all the way up to the cervical spine here. So, if we have certain things posturally that are pinching the nerve up here, whether it be the muscles called the scalenes, uh, the pec minor, maybe the first rib is a little elevated, and that compresses the nerves, in, and, or even at the elbow, it can make it even more likely that you'll have a carpal tunnel problem if posturally you have all these other areas that are compressing it or pinching the nerve up the chain. I call it upriver. And upriver is where the nerve is exiting the spinal cord. So we really want to consider that as a good ergonomic setup to make sure, and that'll be one of our other videos, on how to set that up so we're not doing something um, that's kind of delaying the healing or causing that irritation of the nerve to continue. Gosh, I'm stretching. It's not getting better. It could be that. So repetitive activities are a big thing that we try and modify. Sometimes it's how you're gripping things, how you're positioning things, but those are some of the things we have to look at um, to make sure we're not triggering the carpal tunnel um, as we try and help it out. So one of the things that can really help people out, especially if they're having nighttime discomfort or pain, is a wrist brace, all right? And there's several different types. I'm just gonna show you one right here. All we're trying to do is kind of maintain that neutral position. Like we talked about in, in, in right here, is we're trying to keep everything in this area in straight for the most part, okay? So not excessively bent at night, flex like that. Some people will place it underneath their, you know, their head, they'll kind of curl their arm underneath and that'll extend it for a whole night. And it's almost like taking a, you got a cut on your knuckle and you're holding it there for an hour. Eventually it's going to bother that area and irritate because it's sensitive area, like you had a cut on your knuckle, you're bending that and that's causing irritation to the area that's healing. Same idea. We're trying to get that nerve in a position that's really comfortable. And it's got a lot of room in the wrist. So this is one of the wrist braces. This one right kind of goes across and stabilizes the thumb as well. Um, is trying to prevent the wrist from doing it. I mean, any kind of motion like this is generally fine. In certain special situations, we want to stabilize these fingers and keep them straight too. But the sake of this video, um, this should satisfy. This is a basic brace here. Um, most people get comfortable. They wear it pretty much during the, um, during the nighttime. Some people will selectively wear it um, during the day. Sometimes people can't function what they want to do, so they can't brace uh, during the day with their activities. Okay, um, one thing you can do, I like the braces that have a flexible inside, like a metal stay. And what that means is, they have this inner portion right here. So you can see in my wrist here and how that's trying to contour, you know, my wrist like that. Sometimes these innards are too flex forward and actually the brace is much more flex than you have to. So you can take these inserts out when you buy a brace and kind of simply straighten these. These are pretty malleable. You can bend them a little bit and then replace it back into the splint here and get in the, so you can get that straight position so you put yourself in the best position for the brace. Also, some people, you know, you know, it seems like straight would be better and they find that, you know, oh, it feels better when the, when the brace is not straight but a little bit, I call extended. So play around with this a little bit. I would say give it two or three days of, of trying one position. And you feel like it's really not helping at night or it's making it worse. Try and vary how far you're extending or flexing this brace. Okay, don't do it a lot. I mean, you don't want to be an extreme of a bend, but playing around with how much that changes because that'll change the angle within the brace. Okay, so that's just something that's a great thing that kind of, we're trying to decrease the triggers that are possibly bothering um, your, your, or increasing your symptoms or progressing your symptoms of carpal tunnel. Now this particular stretch really isolates, it kind of glides or flosses the nerve. It's a nerve glide, a median nerve glide. Median nerve is just the nerve that's going through the tunnel. Um, but what the idea is that the nerve is coming off the neck and going through the whole upper arm. So we want to place our hand out to the side like this, place it out like that. You can even start by just allowing your wrist to come out like that. And you may actually feel, wow, I feel like a little bit of that tingling right there. Hold that position for 30 seconds. Okay, I'm getting used to this. Oh, let's do a little bit more. Let's put a little more pressure. Let's hold a little longer. We can also turn the head or side bend the head away from the side. 
and you're going to feel, wow, I can feel some of that whole track, like a little more sensitivity in the whole upper arm as we're doing that. Okay? Eventually, you can apply the pressure so your hand is against a wall. So you can lean against the wall. I'm going to lean against Bucky here, against the wall like this, where you feel that pressure like that. So, and that will bring the wrist into a little bit more finger extension and wrist extension like that. Okay? Um, turning the head away like that will put a little bit more tension through the nerve roots. And that's your median nerve glide. Okay, so that's one of the other ones you can do out of your basically your kind of your basic three. There are other ones you can do, but I would start with that so you don't get overwhelmed. Like I said, three times for 30 seconds, once or twice a day would be the prescription of how often I want you to do it. And also, there's other exercises you can do um, that we're also going to talk about up the chain, meaning things we can work on kind of up here that might be affecting how that nerve root. I kind of want to think of how the nerve root functions, and I kind of want to think of these postural exercises, okay? So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to stretch out our pecs a little bit. We're going to bring our arm overhead position like this. We're going to put both arms like I call it a goal, po goal post. All right, you can step between a door or a corner of a room, stepping forward, and I'll stretch the front and chest musculature and help you prevent that forward position, which can cause everything to be put more on stretch, and it puts all the nerves in a position that's a little more compromised. The other one that we can do um, that also is actually um, working on uh, possibly an elevated first rib. This rib right here essentially can be elevated a little bit and affect the nerve roots as they're exiting um, the spine. So we're trying to, with the idea with this, this first rib is the rib is elevated. And what you don't see here is the nerve roots coming through this area and, then, and the first rib is essentially elevated against those nerve roots, which can happen with certain, um, certain people. Um, in extreme cases, they actually have to remove that portion. So we have that little elevation. We're gonna stretch on me the first rib. We're gonna take our arm. This is a little belt we have here. You can use a towel if you want. You're gonna lock it down against this spot right here. And then you're going to side bend away from that side, creating a stretch here and into the rib area. This one you probably have to start a little bit slower as a lot of nerve roots are coming through this area real close to the surface. And just monitor the tingling and you know, do maybe 5 or 10 seconds first and then slowly progress into that 30 second stretch because this one's a little bit more sensitive. So lock it down. You can see my opposite hand is essentially pushing down and I'm side bending away from the side that bothers me, or the, the side that bothers me. This is the side, this is the treatment side, this is where I'm having the symptoms. It isn't uncommon to have people that have symptoms on both sides, so sometimes you, you know, if you have it on one side, you are probably likely, there's a chance you could get it on the other side. Probably, I'll probably balance these stretches uh, unless they're really bothering you. So remember, these stretches should not make your condition worse. You should not have more tingling or numbness in those hands more than maybe 30 seconds to a minute after the completion of the stretches. So start out gradual. I say three times for 30 seconds is the mantra you hear among a lot of therapists and such. But sometimes people can only tolerate one or two seconds and they got to take pressure off for all the stretches we showed you. So go about it slowly. Do less first. Less is more sometimes. Okay, see how your first day is, you know, start with one session, you know, for all the exercises we gave you, and then move to your second day. Let's see how the next day is. Oh, the next day is pretty good. All right, then I'll do two sessions the next day, and, and slowly you build as you build your confidence that this is a safe exercise. You don't have any more symptoms. Um, it shouldn't make you feel worse from doing it. Like I said, a little bit of discomfort, you know, at the start, that's one thing, um, but it shouldn't last that long. Okay, um, and also, you know, are you feeling like you're weaker? Are you feeling like um, you're having more night pain, which is a common problem with patients that have uh, this type of syndrome? So you, you've got to consider, like, look at all those things that are changing and just to make sure you're doing the right exercise and also make sure you have the proper diagnosis. Some of these problems will seem like carpal tunnel. In actuality, it's, it's a nerve root up in your neck that's really the problem. It's giving you hand numbness. And you go, wow, there's nothing connecting. I don't feel problems going down the chain here. Um, sometimes you just feel it in your hand. That's not an uncommon scenario. Unfortunately, it's very confusing for everyone, and it's confusing for the patient. So you're going ahead, and you're stretching, stretching, stretching our hand. And what's actually going on is there's something going on in your neck, um, or you have other areas that are causing these nerve symptoms that you're not really directly addressing. But carpal tunnel is often, I think, used as a garbage term. People say it a lot, 
but we got to make sure we're in the right spot. We have to establish our diagnosis first, uh, and that's really important to make sure you know, we have a great. We don't waste our time or actually uh, irritate our ir to irritate anything or bother yourselves. So I hope this helps you out. Subscribe if you thought you got something from this. If you're not a subscriber, we're going to be posting future videos, other ideas on neck complaints, other areas that, that relate to carpal tunnel as well. And just smash that like button if you like it and uh, share it with anyone that you think might have this problem and is a little concerned. And uh, take it for the next step. Have a great day and thanks for listening.